With Pokemon Go's Hoenn Tour coming up, I thought Groudon would be a fun legendary to put into Generation 1. Generation 3 is notoriously known for having too much water, so maybe this pure ground type legendary can find a home in Kanto today. Now to do this, I utilized the Poke Red assembly, I modified the game a bit, and I built a custom ROM to do this run on. Now this is a bit of an oversimplification, but that's just the gist for you. And the sprites you'll see today are not my own creation. I took the front sprite from Sanqui and the back sprite is a modified version from the same place where I just kind of added a little bit to it in Photoshop. Now looking at these stats, Groudon's worst one is 90 and that's in speed and that's really all you need to know. As a box art legendary, it's exceptional in everything and the 150 base attack stands out as the most impressive thing here. As far as the moves, I'm using Groudon's generation 9 learn set as a base. Now as of recording this, Groudon isn't out in Scarlet and Violet yet, but it will be, and we already know the moves that it's going to have. I've added three brand spanking new moves today, and we'll talk about how I gen one those in a second, but outside of cutting out some moves like Mudshot and Scary Face, I substituted things like Bulk Up for Meditate and Hammer Arm for Submission, and you can see on the notable TMs that there are things like Thunderbolt and Rock Slide for some much needed coverage. Now, I also substituted Ancient Power for Rock Throw, since there's just no more rock moves in Generation 1, and my first thought was that I would never use it anyway and I was even gonna write something down like I'd rather squirt jalapeno juice in my eyes than use a 65% accurate move but what ended up happening in my testing is that it was necessary for a few battles and it just felt really bad if you got a bad string of luck maybe missed a few times and you end up losing a battle because of that it just didn't really feel like it represented Groudon but rather just a really bad gen 1 move now I don't have the tech to implement ancient power with this chance to boost all stats just yet. So after going back and forth for a solution, I landed on just changing Rock Throw to have Ancient Power 60 base power and 100% accuracy rather than going through the trouble of making a whole new move. Now this will not be represented on the sidebar. The sidebar is just the old Gen 1 move because this change didn't happen until real late in development, but I'm saying it now. We're all on the same page. We know what's happening. We start off with two of those new moves and they are Lava Plume and Precipice Blade. Lava Plume is kind of like a weaker flamethrower, but it does have that higher 30% burn chance, which is a nice little bonus, and fire is actually going to be helpful for mowing down pesky bugs and grass tops we might find along the way. The big boy move today is Groudon's signature move, it's Precipice Blades. This is kind of like a slightly better Hydro Pump clone, because it does have 5% more accuracy, and it has 5 more PP, and with 120 base power along with Stab, this thing is gonna hit like a dump truck and you can see that in this open and rival battle it's really not fair i should probably say sorry i'd also like to quickly say that if you enjoy solo run content and you want to help me out help the channel out whether you're someone new maybe someone who just doesn't know what to say or maybe you're a returning subscriber like gregory horn just scroll down hit that like button and type in too much water and i would really appreciate the support and if you haven't already sit back relax get your soda pops out because this one's gonna be a pretty good one going into the run, I had a singular goal of beating Skeledurge's time, because there were several comments from that video that just told me that Torch Song was so busted, the power creep going back into Gen 1, and that no other run would really beast the game as much as it did, so I really wanted to beat its time on the very first cross-gen run after it. Now overall, Groudon's routing was unique, and it starts right here in Viridian Forest by actually picking up an optional battle on the very first bug catcher. Now the battle itself is just two one-shots. It's nothing spectacular, but it is helpful when we look ahead at Brock. And he's known as the rock hard Pokemon trainer for a reason guys, and it's because his Pokemon have crazy high defense stats. Now on Geodude, not even the massive precipice blades can one shot and it hangs on. And you might wonder why I just don't finish it off with Lava Plume since it has weak special, and the answer is that it has 6 HP right now, and Lava Plume has only a 50-50 shot at doing 6 damage, so I didn't want to risk having to use another move, so let's just move on. Now for the Onyx, this is the main reason for that extra battle 
battle earlier. Without the optional bug catcher experience, there's around a 30% chance that the Onyx could survive two precipice blades and keep on ticking, but with that extra experience, it's a guaranteed two shot, and overall this one's over pretty quick. At the end of the battle, I do hit level nine, and this means that I get a very early earth power. Now this is the third move that I added, and it's essentially a slightly weaker earthquake that has the ability to lower the opponent's attack on a chance. In current generations, this is a special attack, and it functions almost pretty much like the special version of Earthquake, and it carries a special drop chance, but since that's not a thing in Gen 1, there's no physical special split, you can see why I made the change to an attack drop. Now from there, having 20 power points of very powerful ground moves, as well as coverage, makes things fairly easy, so we really don't have to go into it, everything's going to be pretty trivial, and we don't have to really manage, micromanage, I guess you would say, our PP too much. Inside of Mount Moon, I do pick up one additional battle. It's the Super Nerd with the Voltorb and the Magnemite. I talk about him a lot. He's very rich in experience, a very easy battle. And the important thing about this is it allows us to hit level 14 rather than being stuck at level 13 without it. And it's pretty significant when we take a look at rival number two. Pidgeotto's always a menace. Level 14 allows us to outspeed it and it ups our chances. But this thing is so bulky, it surprises me. Hardly anything can one-shot it and there's no exception here. We can do really heavy damage, but we don't crit, and that means we're open to a sand attack, and that's exactly what happens. Now, Groudon luckily has the stats to back it up, and it can really just power through this fight, so I end up knocking everything out in pretty much one move anyway, but I do miss several times due to the sand attack, so it does waste a little bit of time at the end of the day, but it really doesn't matter. We outsped the Pidgeotto, and if we didn't pick up those extra battles earlier, we might have taken more sand attacks than that, but it went pretty well, all things considering. Just like we talked about earlier, I got tons of PP, we got coverage for all the bugs and flyers that we need to, so it's really not an issue on Nugget Bridge to make it through very easy. Now, it's worth noting at level 18, I do get the chance to learn Meditate. It's in a single stage attack boosting move. It's pretty good, and I probably should have learned it, especially if you want to be a little bit more consistent, but I didn't really think about it at the time. Without this move, Misty is a little bit harder, and most Pokemon that are weak to Misty have to skip her, but today, Groudon's gonna channel its inner primal form, and we're gonna take on Misty right away when we get done. Star you simple, one ground move will knock it out. And I will say that if you have Meditate here, you could just use it a couple of times, and that would really pay dividends when we look ahead at the Star Me. Because I'm gonna be honest with you guys, this is the optimized run, but as far as Misty goes, the only thing you can do is hope that it doesn't use two bubble beams in a row, because that will knock you out 100% of the time. And what you know it, it just lets loose a bubble beam immediately, and we're in a bad spot. But we do hit back with an Earth Power, and you can see that we hit really hard as as well. Now for the moment of truth, does it go for Bubble Beam? No, it goes for Water Gun, and we barely hang on with one single HP, but Groudon stands tall, we throw out one more Earth Power, and we actually take this fight early. It's impressive to do this fight with no resets in general, especially if you're weak, but I will say that there's a precedent for this, because runs like Charizard have already done this to where you're weak to Misty, but your stats or whatever the situation may be, you're set up to where you don't have to skip Misty, and the Overall, this does save a lot of time in the run, especially when you're looking to do things like beat Skeledurge's time. But Groudon had a really good showing here, and I love it when Pokemon barely hang on, so it was a good battle, and I enjoyed seeing that. Now we could skip it all the way down to the SSN, and something that kind of surprised me when I was routing this out and getting the best time possible was that Body Slam simply just isn't needed. It never really does more than any other move that I got, and it just saves time. We skip a battle, we don't have to learn the TM, so we actually skip it. But I do take on the gentleman, and I'd like to take this opportunity to talk about Precipice Blades. Now, 85% accuracy doesn't seem that bad, but everybody who plays Gen 1 knows if it doesn't have 100% accuracy, it's got 0% accuracy. And here, you can see the absolute worst case scenario for Precipice Blades. I missed three straight times on the Growlithe, and this doesn't feel good, and eventually I do knock it out, but this does make the battle a lot longer than it should be, and it kind of undermines some of 
of your careful routing from earlier in the run. And just to rub salt in the wound, I miss an additional time on the Ponyta, and that's just kind of funny. Now this likely will not happen where you miss four times in a single battle, but I guess it's just, I'm putting this in here just to show you that even though Precipice Blades is an absolute monster of a move, there's going to be a lot of times in the run where it's going to leave a little bit to be desired because of that accuracy. As for rival number three, our Groudon's a different man than he was for rival number two. We have now caught up in levels, and that means that we can just one-shot this Pidgeotto. There's no sand attack today, and everything that we have, especially our ground moves, is going to be overkill for the rest. We really don't need to talk about it, and just like that, we can just we can slap around Surge real quick, I guess. And fun fact about Surge, uh, in Pokemon Yellow, they changed his AI to be random, not good, and they gave him some normal moves, and I guess it's because of Pokemon like this. Now, ground type, Raichu can't actually hurt you, so like... Like, even if you were to miss 10 times in a row, there's just nothing he could do. So, this is a free battle. We already knew it would be. This is about the worst that Surge could ever look, just considering the circumstances with Groudon being a legendary. And just like that, we're moving on. And from there, Rock Tunnel and the route leading up to it just aren't that interesting. I got great coverage. Everything's easy. But instead, I'd like to go on a little bit of a tangent real quick. Now, back in December, I did the Kyogre run, but we were using the Sanqui website, and I originally originally wanted it to be a series with the Gen 3 Weather Trio that sounded really cool, but the sad reality is that there's just way too many Pokemon that just get completely shafted by Sanqui in terms of their moveset. Now Groudon was a prime example of this. Sanqui uses the Gen 6 learn set, and if you get a Groudon as a starter, it just has Tackle or Scratch, I don't remember which one, it doesn't matter. But you have to use that alone all the way up to level 30, and your reward for hitting level 30 is Rest, which is, isn't helpful at all. You have to go up to level 35 to get Earthquake, and just to put that into context with other slow leveling group solo runs I've done, it would roughly be about 5 badges deep, probably somewhere around Silphco, where you could just pick up Earthquake anyway, so it's just really trash, it's really bad, and Groudon is just one example of a Pokemon that's done really dirty by the limitations of Sanqui, but to be fair, Sanqui is designed just to be a randomizer first and foremost, and it has 6 generations of Pokemon, so it's not really surprising that they just can't add in every single move and cater to things like signature moves and all that. It was never meant to be a cross-gen solo run thing like I started back in 2021, and that's pretty much the main reason why I started to put in the work and do my own thing with these cross-gen runs. Now, I guess that's a bit of a tangent. I don't want to go on too long, but it leads me to a question for you guys specifically. Rayquaza was pretty much the same way as Groudon. It had a trash move set in Sanqui, but with these new cross-gen runs that I'm doing, I I do think that I could do Rayquaza justice. And what I'm asking is if you guys would still like to see Rayquaza, should I complete the trilogy? Type in below, yes Ray or no Ray. And I'm gonna Google real quick to see if I'm saying Rayquaza because people get really angry when you mispronounce stuff. All right, after pausing the recording, it appears that it's Rayquaza, a mix of the words Ray and Quasar. So who knew? I was saying it wrong all the time. I got that wrong. I got Kyoga wrong. I guess I can't pronounce Gen 3 Pokemon right. And what are you going to do about it, you know? From there, we can just skip it all the way to Celadon. And there's a couple little interesting thing about Groudon's run as a whole. Now, the first thing we do is go to the Rocket Hideout, but it's worth noting that I don't pick up any high money items because simply put, Groudon just doesn't need vitamins. I am gonna get some, but I don't have to go out of my way and waste time by picking up extra money because it just is really strong on its own. And the only thing at the start here that's worth noting is that at level 27, you learn Earthquake naturally and it's really good it's it's a very slight upgrade over earth power but it's earthquake guys it's really strong it's a really good move it's kind of like the in-between earth power and precipice blades I like it a little better just because of the hundred percent accuracy but for now we'll just keep both of them on the learn set and I do think it's worth noting that precipice blade is worth its slot for now because there are some spots it's gonna happen a few times here and there let like sand slash here the only thing that will one hit it and save you some time is precipice blades and if you can just get past that 85 percent accuracy it can save you a little bit of time overall that's why we're hanging on to it as for giovanni what is there to say his pokemon are weak to ground moves and we're pretty high level at this point so we just kind of demolish everything the kangaskhan can survive one hit so let's just keep it rolling let's see what i do next and today my friends groudon is going to show why it's a top tier legendary it's going to take on erica really early this is just like a misty situation you normally would 
would not do this under any circumstances, mainly because of that 100% crit razor leaf. And let's just take a little look at it. And like we just talked about, this is another situation where Precipice Blades comes in clutch. That extra base power does allow me to one-shot the Victory Bell. Now, I crit in the footage, but it doesn't matter. And as for Tangela, Tangela's the worst Pokemon. Don't get me started on Tangela. Uh, we do have Lava Plume. It's a little bit tanky, so it takes a little bit to go down, but all it does is use the very pathetic Constrict on us. And from there, it's just cleanup duty. Now, on the Vile Plume, I do miss a Precipice Blades, and that opens me up to a Petal Dance. And here, you can see just how much damage it does. It does about half our health, which is pretty good. So, it's just a reminder that we're taking this fight on very early. It's normally a very scary fight. If you're weak to Erica, it's one of the hardest fights in the entire game. It's very impressive that Groudon was able to get through this one so early, nonchalantly almost. And I guess the main reason outside of money I like to do Erica this early, if you can swing it, is because it gives you like a clear path. It really connects the process of doing Erica. Now you can go shop at Celadon Mart, and then when you're done with that, you can go pick up Fly. It really connects those things. It feels really smooth and really efficient. And like I said earlier, I didn't pick up any high money items, so when it comes time to buy vitamins we can only afford four proteins but that's really all we need and from there we can move on i did pick up rock slide here it won't be relevant until a little bit later in the run but it is an upgrade just a strict upgrade over rock throw now i think we can pick up the pace we don't want to just show one shot after one shot so rival number four there he is he's down pokemon tower series of one shots we can skip it ahead and just like that we're down in the safari zone i am picking up the final hms of the run and it's worth noting that I am skipping the Carbos here. 90 base speed is just good enough to outspeed pretty much everything in the entire game, so you do not need it. Picking up the second full restore right here is also key because Groudon will not need to heal that much in the Elite Four, so that means I don't have to buy, and I can just save even more time when it comes to the end game. We're kind of thinking ahead at this point. Keeping the pace going, we can go straight to Koga. We have ground, very strong staff ground moves against his weak poison types, and here I use Earthquake on the Coughings, and then on the more powerful Pokemon like Muck and Weezing, I will switch to Precipice Blades, and it looks like it's going pretty well so far. But at the end of the fight, it gets a little bit scary, I'm not gonna lie to you guys. The 85% accuracy of Precipice Blade strikes once again. I miss two times in a row, and in those two turns, Koga sets up an X attack, and the already incredibly strong self-destruct is now boosted, and it does heavy damage to us, but Groudon's a tanky beast. We survive with 34 HP and we take this battle. After that, I head to Silphco. And the next optimization for Groudon is that I do not need to visit the 10th floor. I don't need Earthquake. I don't need the Carbos. And at this point, routing everything out, I didn't even need the rare candy. So I saved myself some time by just cutting it out. But there is one extra errand that I'm going to do today. I go up to the 7th floor and the very lovely and beautiful Swords Dance team is just laying there begging us to take it and originally I didn't use swords dance I didn't think it was needed so when I started cutting out rare candies and cutting out more spots I needed just that little extra punch and that's what swords dance provides for us especially looking towards the end game fights I do replace precipice blades here because if you think about it if you absolutely need it you can swords dance into an earthquake it's gonna be stronger than it ever was and we've just missed too much this wasn't an uncommon occurrence this is the best run I've done and after doing three or so Groudon runs I can honestly say that you miss Precipice Blades quite a good bit so good riddance it's been fun using a signature move and all that but it's time to let it go it's very important to let go guys before we hop into the next major battle I do go ahead and learn Rock Slide here it's just a strict upgrade and it helps out a good bit to help you reach some of those damage ranges that you crucially need looking ahead and that means rival number five is coming up next let's just take a look Pidgeot is first and unfortunately it has sand attack there's no world where outside of a crit that we one shot it so i set up a single swords dance and then i'm going to one shot it with rock slide but unfortunately that gives it a turn between that and it goes for sand attack and everybody loves sand attack i love progressing in the battle with it so let's just see if it causes us any problems i don't miss on the growlith it goes down then execute comes in rock slide is a one shot from this range but i do miss it feels really bad using rock slide with its less than 100% accuracy after you take an sand attack, but what are you gonna do, really? I get leech seated for my trouble, then I knock it out, and now the 
Alakazam comes in. I roll the dice, I throw out an earthquake, it connects. It's an easy one shot, easiest one shot of my life. And I guess at level 36 when you level up, I can learn submission. But let me just tell you guys, submission is awful. One of the worst moves ever. It has less accuracy than Precipice Blade. That's gonna be a no thanks from me, dog. And finally up is the Blastoise. Once again, Groudon rolls that lucky dice, hits the earthquake, and that's the battle over. And we've seen a couple of fights already, lots of fights, even just in this condensed video where I just miss a ton. And it just, it's kind of unfortunate. It does add up. And remember that when we get to the end of the run and we're looking at the final time and all that, remember all these misses and sand attacks and stuff that I took in this run. And I guess just think about what could have been. From there, I think we could just go slap around Sabrina a little bit. Her first two Pokemon are easy one shots. We outspeed. There's no ranges here. It's easy, one and done. And something I'd like to talk about in the Venomoth, I go Earthquake here. And something that's always reminded to me back in the day with comments is that a stabbed Earthquake that's neutral and a super effective Rock Slide do the same damage. So I just keep going for Earthquake here. And I'm honestly surprised it hit with Venomoth being a flying type and all. Now as for the Alakazam, it does outspeed. So it does get its own little shot, little crack at Groudon. And all it does is use a wasted recover. We take it out and we take another easy badge, another quick one. From there, there's a slight tingle in the air tonight. My ground senses are tingling. I know there's a fire type weakness waiting in the wings. And since Groudon is such a monster, there's no need to do any extra battles today. So after a little bit of the age old question of Tombstoner, brother. I think we could just take a look at this massacre that's inevitable. And I guess the only thing I'm gonna talk about in this fight is uh, preserving PP and avoiding having to heal later. So to do that, to remedy using all of my earthquakes, I used three rock slides on the first three Pokemon. It's a guaranteed one shot. And as for the Arcanine, it's really tanky. So you do need an earthquake for that. So I just preserved some of my earthquake usage. And overall, ground type versus fire types, <laughs> what else is there to say? But that is seven badges down. As for Giovanni, this one actually turns out to be kind of interesting, but not the Rhyhorn. The Rhyhorn's absolute garbage. Get it out of here. Let's move on. Now, something I didn't foresee here is that the Doug Trio outspeeds me. I was cutting out battles to make this the optimized run, and when we finally got to this result, I did not see this coming. So, of course, obviously, it's going to go for Sand Attack, and that's going to cause some huge problems, considering if you look up in the top left, we're very limited on our Earthquake PP, and I just kind of... I I thought I was gonna come in here and just earthquake everything once and just get out of here. But here's what happens. I get sand attacked and it turns this battle into a complete slog where I have to rely on lava plume and earthquakes just missing and everything's really slow. And honestly, watching this back and we're gonna go through the rest of this run, but I do think at the very end, I think I'm just gonna play another run just for fun because I think a battle like this along with a few other things probably cost me a solid minute or two of in-game time and I'm just I'm not okay with that honestly but yeah Giovanni final badge it turned into this absolute slog because of a single sand attack and I hate it but it is what it is now let's take a look at rival number six Pidgeot is first and the key to this fight is two swords dance now I don't want to set both up on the Pidgeotto just because it can actually do damage to us so I do set up one then take it out and I set up my next one on the Rhyhorn Rhyhorn's really bad seriously if you don't know go look up its level up learn set that's all you really need to know but I just finished setting up here I get a plus four boost and from that point on everything's pretty much a one shot execute can survive a lava plume which that was kind of bad luck I do believe I had around an 83% chance to one shot it so it's it, it survived it is what it is it just went for a potion and we get through this battle now things are looking very easy guys I understand that sometimes you get that with these kind of videos but I guess the totality of the run and the final time and being able to route all this stuff is really the fun part for me so forgive me if I'm not going in depth with all these battles I think I'm doing you guys a favor by just kind of skimming them over because you know I'm not gonna feign excitement you know how some people do this is a complete tangent off the top of my head right now something that really bothers me I hate it when you're watching solo run content it doesn't matter specifically like J Rose does this a lot other people do it too where they fake excitement they act like they don't know what's gonna happen and they have like this fake excited voice even though they they know exactly how it's gonna play out it just doesn't sit right with me it doesn't feel
feel genuine and it just comes off as kind of fake. Another key thing to note, like earlier I said I skipped the Rare Candy in Silphco, I'm also going to skip the Rare Candy in Victory Road because I just simply don't need it. Now looking back, I should have used, I should have picked up an extra one, maybe used it going into the Doug Trio so I outsped, but hindsight's 2020. we'll correct that at the end of this video. And now we can just look ahead at the Elite Four. Now obviously we're weak to ice, we haven't seen much ice, I don't think we've seen any ice at all, so Lorelai could be a problem, but outside of that, Groudon's looking pretty primed. Uh, ever since Misty, that was the only single fight in the game that's kind of like bled a little bit, so I'm excited. I think we could just kind of dive into the Elite Four. Now strap yourselves in because this is going to be pretty quick. Now on Lorelai, we need to set up just a single time. Now we set up and we take a critical hit Aurora Beam. That takes us all the way down to 54 health. And you might think that this one's not looking good. But unfortunately for Lorelai, we're already set up once. And the writing's pretty much on the wall. I do have a scary moment on the Cloister where I miss the Rock Slide. But then it misses the Clamp on the follow up. Which I'm sure that probably would have knocked us out if it hit even just three or four times. But still, I hit the next time, and you can just see even one Swords Dance is enough to knock out the very tanky Cloister, and you already know what's going to happen after that. It's pretty much an easy, pretty much a very clean sweep from there. The slow bro does hit me with a Water Gun and take me really low, but guys, remember, all I need, all Groudon needs is one HP to win this one, and that's what happens. And if this is the fight we're supposed to be weak to, how's the rest of the Elite Four going to look like? And I guess we can start to answer that question by taking a look at Bruno. And I get all, there's no setup required. All you have to do is just go straight Earthquake. That's it. It's Bruno. It's another week of Bruno. Uh, we can move on. And something I'm really thankful for this week is that Agatha is about as easy as Bruno. Now, the only thing to note here, I do outspeed everything. Earthquake can one-shot everything. Now, the only thing to note for this fight is that Golbat has a pretty high, like pretty much a 50-50 chance of surviving a rock slide. It could use Haze or something else that could be a detriment meant to you but here it just gets a wing attack in and that's it it's a very easy fight perhaps easier than bruno and that i love to see it since agatha is usually such a menace especially when you're playing some weaker runs now my friends lance is next and we haven't mentioned gyarados and we're weak to water so how is this one going to play out now the idea here is that we have decent special we use swords dance we're going to need at least one swords dance and that's going to boost our special anyway so we should be able to comfortably tank a hydro pump outside of like a crit or something like that now here i set up once it misses the hydro pump and honestly guys that pretty much seals the deal and ends the battle right there on its own making it to the next pokemon at full health just means i have pretty much complete and total free reign of this fight the aerodactyl does outspeed me but bless his heart there's nothing he can really do to me with our pretty crazy high defense and that's the battle over this elite four is looking very easy i'm all for it but if you look at the time it's getting really close Close. I want to beat Skeledurge's time. Let's see if that's possible by looking at the champion fight. Overall, I think you guys kind of know what to expect by now, but this fight has the one unique distinction of being the one battle that I have to fully set up Swords Dance, all three. I have not had to set up all three. Usually none or one is usually where I have to go with this, but we need three. I set them all up on the Pidgeot, and with the badge boost to speed, that does mean we now outspeed the Alakazam, and what was probably the most threatening Pokemon on his team is now down just like that, and everything's pretty much going to start to fall like dominoes. And you might be wondering why I set up three times. It's for the last two Pokemon, specifically the Executor. It's a very hard Pokemon to one shot. And if you can't, it has the really high chance of just using Hypnosis and it could waste a lot more turns than just setting up a couple of extra Swords Dance early in the fight. Now here I get that easy little Rock Slide one shot range. I'm very happy about it. And then at the end, I've already mentioned the three Swords Dance setup being important for the last two. That includes Blastoise. We outspeed. One earthquake puts the final nail in the coffin, and that's it. 
with a final time of 2 hours, 13 minutes, and 41 seconds. It is indeed faster than Skele Dirge, but guys, I'm going to be honest with you. I'll talk about this run for a second. Groudon finishes the run with a 2 hour, 13 minute, and 41 second run, and that indeed does beat the Skele Dirge run, but there's kind of a bad taste in my mouth, guys. There's a few mistakes that I made in this run, and it's not really good enough for me just to say, hey, I beat Skele Dirge, because there's a lot of missed opportunities that I had when doing this run. So it, this run was fantastic overall. I think we'll talk about the totality of it and just kind of what I think about it in just a second. But let's go over just a couple of things that I want to change and see how those affect the final time. And honestly, guys, this wasn't planned. Uh, when I was watching back the footage, I looked at the numbers and I was like, oh, I could do this. So I pretty much recorded this entire video. And then when I made it to this point, I'm like, no, 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 I'm going to play Groudon one more time because I made some major blunders. So it's real quick. It's not going to be like the usual where it takes me, you know, 10 minutes to go over everything I corrected. I really just want to go over that Giovanni fight one more time and see how much that would really affect the final time. So let's get done with that real quick. I'll be back when I'm done recording that. So the solution to quickly wrap up this video is that you simply pick up the Carbos in the Safari Zone and in Pokemon Mansion, and that's going to let you outspeed the Doug Trio without compromising your rare candy usage. If you're thinking, hey, that's obvious, well, I just personally didn't think Doug Trio would be a threat, but Sand Attack, guys, it's infuriating. Now, when you're just on a tight PP budget, it can just kill your time, and that's what happened in the first run. Now, even if Doug Trio technically only has a 1 in 5 chance to use Sand attack when you factor in the guard spec by Silphco, we saw earlier that there's no reason to take the risk. Overall, some slightly cleaner play combined with better elixir and ether management allowed me to shave off about two minutes before I even made it to Giovanni. Now, one of the big things to optimize the optimized run was simply using Precipice Blades less. The spots that it actually provides a benefit over Earth Power or Earthquake are few and far between, and we saw that the 85% accuracy did cost me some time here in there. And at the end of the day, the Elite Four was smooth like it was the last time, and counting saving time in the actual Giovanni fight, I clock in at 2 hours, 10 minutes, and 24 seconds, which is over a 3 minute improvement off of the earlier run. Now, it goes without saying that I'm very happy with this result, and as of making this video, this is the second fastest run I've ever done outside of the Alakazam livestream I did a while ago. Now, I love Skeleton Dirge, guys. Torch Song, one of my favorite moves, but this video just goes to show you that we've barely scratched the surface on broken Pokemon. And when I get about five of these cross-gen runs done, these custom ones, I'll start making a tier list that we can look at at the end of the video. But it was fun, and that's about all I have for you guys. Now, if you made it this far, you enjoy the content, and you aren't subscribed, what are you doing, brother? I do this every week. You will like it. Just hit the button. And once again, special shout out to my channel members. I appreciate the support, and you guys are the MVP of the channel. And if you became a member recently, and you aren't on this list, it's because I tend to get ahead in my videos because sometimes your boy just doesn't have the time to play any Pokemon some weeks since this is just a side hobby of mine but I think that'll do it for me I'll catch you guys in the next video bye